Okay, for the second speaker, uh, we have uh, Disha Pangat uh, pa Kapasi from the Australian National University, where she is a PhD student. Uh, and in particular, she is working uh, with Professor David McClellan. Leland, uh, on technologies for future gravitational wave detectors. Um, and today she's going to tell us about her work on presenting and characterizing a narrow line with an external cavity diode laser that works at two micron wavelength. Now this is a, a low cost, high performance alternative to fiber lasers, and it could be incorporated into next generation gravitational wave detectors. Uh, for her research, she has also worked before actually at the Caltech LIGO lab. Hi, I'm Disha P. Kapasi, and I'm a PhD student from the Australian National University. And today I'll be talking about probing deeper into the gravitational universe using near infrared lasers. About 100 years ago, Albert Einstein formulated the theory of general relativity, which predicts the existence of gravitational waves. These gravitational waves are perturbations in the fabric of space time that come from catastrophic events like black hole mergers, neutron star mergers, supernova explosions, and so on. And these gravitational waves are expected to travel at the speed of light. What you see in this animation on your left hand side is the response of a ring of free particles to a passing gravitational wave. As the wave passes in the z direction or perpendicular to this ring of particles, you can see that the particles itself compress and stretch in orthogonal directions. What we are trying to measure here are actually tiny length fluctuations, which is roughly a million times smaller than the size of a proton using an instrument called the Michelson interferometer. The animation now on your right hand side will show what a typical gravitational wave observatory would look like. We have the laser that comes from one side and splits into two orthogonal directions in the X and Y arms. And the light propagates in this until it reaches the end mirror, reflects back and recombines at the beam splitter. And the interference signal is now detected at the output port on a photodiode camera or a CCD. What you see at the output right now in this animation is a very exaggerated signal, whereas, like I said, what we measure is something really tiny. It's important to note that the laser here is our ruler, which helps us measure these length fluctuations. And hence, the stability is an important criteria for the observatory. Here, we discuss the different sources available uh, in the gravitational wave spectrum. So starting from the millisecond band, are sources that are there in the universe. At the far right, we have the milliseconds or kilohertz bandwidth, which, com which comprises from compact binary in spirals from black holes and neutron stars to pulsars and supernovae, and they can be detected by our ground-based terrestrial interferometers. And as we go to the longer periods, we have the more massive objects, such as the supermassive black hole in spiral and mergers. And these supermassive black holes are the ones that reside at the center of our galaxy. And using different instruments, such as radio pulsar timing arrays, space-based interferometers, and terrestrial interferometers, we can cover the entire gravitational wave spectrum. And it can complement all the information that we know from our traditional electromagnetic telescopes. Here, what we see is a sensitivity graph of different detectors. So on your left-hand side is the graph that compares all the detectors, some of them that are currently running and some that are proposed and are going to be built in the future. On the y-axis, we have it in units of strain noise per root hertz, where strain is a dimensionless quantity and is a ratio of the arm length fluctuations over the baseline of your detector, and the x-axis is in frequency. The way to read off this graph is lower the curve, better the sensitivity. We have current detectors such as CAGRA, Advance, Virgo, and LIGO in the top three traces. And as we move to future detectors such as Cosmic Explorer 1 and 2, an Einstein telescope, we have higher sensitivity, which means we look further out into the universe. And converting this into a horizon plot, which calculates in terms of the cosmological redshift, you can clearly see as we move from current detectors towards future detectors like Cosmic Explorer 1, 2, and the Einstein telescope, we can cover almost all of the and neutron stars that we can see up to redshifts of 100. Hence, an enhanced detector performance will extend the horizon for gravitational wave observations. However, before moving on to better detectors, we need to prototype and demonstrate technologies. And some of them are silicon mirrors, better coatings, 
cryogenics, monolithic silicon suspensions, high-powered lasers, quantum noise suppression, and new laser wavelengths. I work on multiple technologies, but today we'll talk about a new laser wavelength. Some of the future detectors are expected to operate at the two micron wavelength. Currently, we don't have a reliable low noise source at two micron wavelength for which we can prototype all the other technologies. Hence, a stable source will help us demonstrate technologies into coatings, photodiodes, quantum noise suppression. And from the various laser configurations, we have chosen the external cavity diode laser for its simplicity and high performance, and it can be made easily from commercially available products. So what you can see over here on your right is the two micron external cavity diode laser that has been built at the Australian National University. And below is the paper that summarizes all the results from this. Moving on, we have the design of the ECDL. Like I said, it's a very simple and compact design and it comprises of very few components. The first one is the gain chip. So the gain chip is the active medium in which the laser transition is pumped and the light comes out which is then followed by a lens that helps collimating the beam and directs it towards the diffraction grating. The diffraction grating is a wavelength tuning element and it is aligned in a literal configuration where the first order diffracted light is retro reflected towards the laser. And by tuning, one can tune the wavelength of the laser. And we last have the piezoelectric transducer which converts an electrical signal into a displacement and hence by, by, by changing the grating angle, we can change the wavelength. This entire assembly is very compact and then the laser performance of this entire ECDL is, um, is measured using a, an unbalanced interferometer. The first result that I would like to discuss is the relative intensity noise. So relative intensity noise is the fluctuations in the intensity of light itself normalized over its average power. This graph here has on y-axis RIN in units of one per root hertz, which is the amplitude spectral density, and on x-axis we have frequency. It compares two lasers, the, the ECDL that I have built, which is the lavender trace, and it compares that to a commercial fiber laser, which is the red trace. As you can see, over the entire frequency span, the ECDL has superior performance to the fiber laser. However, it's important to note that this measurement is limited by the darkness of the photodiode, which highlights that a stable low-cost 2 micron source such as our ECDL would help R&D into, uh, which, which it will help people to make better photodiodes and do R&D into such a field. The next one I would like to discuss is the frequency noise. And the frequency noise refers to the random fluctuations in the instantaneous uh, frequency of an oscillating signal. As you can see over here, I've again made a comparison between the commercial available fiber laser to our ECDL. At all frequencies above 200 Hertz, the ECDL has a superior performance compared to the fiber laser. And at frequencies over three kilohertz, the, the frequency noise of the ECDL is at 15 Hertz per root Hertz. We also have a special line on this plot, which is the gray dash, dash starred line, which is the standard NPRO line, where NPRO stands for non-planar ring oscillator. This laser is the workhorse of a gravitational wave interferometer and is the best low noise laser developed up to up till now. And as you can see, comparing the ECDL to this standard laser, we have comparable performance up to one kilohertz. Some of the highlights of this work. Currently, the two micron ECDL is the only high performance and low cost laser that can be used in this gravitational wave research. And with such a laser, we can actually help accelerate R&D into two micron technologies, photodiodes, quantum noise suppressions and coatings, all of which are active areas for the future detectors. The ECDL has a low optical power at its output, Hence, with collaboration from University of Adelaide, we are building a pre-amplifier to account for this. LIGO groups across Adelaide, Caltech, University of Glasgow, and Cardiff have been collaborating to build their own unit for their research labs. Lastly, this laser also finds application in medicine, gas sensing, metrology, defense, LIDAR, and many other fields. And I will leave you with my acknowledgments, and I would like to thank all my colleagues and friends who've been helping me throughout. Thank you so much. 
Okay, um, thank you, Disha, for your lovely talk. Absolutely beautiful slides. <laughs> and I really enjoyed the animations of the uh, gravitational waves and the interferometer. Um, thank you any so questions? Much. <laughs> any questions from the floor, please? Okay, maybe I'll, I'll just start off uh, with some questions. Um, so you had mentioned in your talk, Disha, that some of the future detectors are expected to work at the two micron wavelength. So um, what, what do the current detectors work at and why, why the move to two microns? Excellent question. So the current detectors operate at 1064 nanometers or one micron. And the mirrors at the end of the interferometers, if you've noticed in the animation, they're test mirrors and they're currently made of fused silica, which is like our glass. Uh, but future detectors uh, are meant to be operated at cryogenic temperatures. Now, if you cool down glass and go to cryogenic temperatures, uh, the inherent noise in the material itself is much higher and you want all the noise to be as low as possible. So, uh, so in future detectors, we're transiting from few silica to silicon optics. And now if you're changing the material of your test mass itself, you need, you need a laser that can transmit and to that wavelength. That means the reflectivity and the transmittivity of your coatings in that mirror should be suitable to the laser, which is your ruler in this case. So hence the shift towards longer wavelengths. I see. So it's a, it's a general longer wavelength um, yes. shift. Um, then a follow-up question. In this case, why two microns and not something longer? So uh, two micron, because at around two micron, uh, silicon has the highest like reflectivity uh, from the mirrors. And also because around the two micron region, uh, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of absorption in the uh, water particles, but you also have narrow bands between these absorption lines wherein you can tune your laser. So it's not exactly two micron, it can be 1984 or 1990, but where there is a transmission gap between the absorption molecules, uh, you can use the two micron laser over there because it's ground based. So there's water in the atmosphere and not everything is in the vacuum tube. Some optics are outside of the vacuum tank itself. So you need the wavelength that uh, is not absorbed by the atmosphere itself. Okay, thanks for the very clear explanation. Uh, a question from uh, Dr. Bolut. Uh, a naive question, why is it so important to better understand cosmic waves? What role does it play in the universe? So um, all the detections we've made so far are from electromagnetic telescopes, which come from the infrared band, optical band and go all the way to X-rays and ultraviolet uh, rays. Uh, but gravitational waves encodes different kinds of information that we're not, we've not yet seen. So for example, when we've never seen actual black hole mergers from, uh, from electromagnetic telescopes, but we can sense them through gravitational waves. And that gives us a lot of information about the material and put constraints on different theories that are out there. So when we make detections, we don't only just test GR, but we also test alternative theories uh, about cosmic strings and ultralight boson particles and see what works best. And this is what is important. And we use gravitational waves to study. OK, great. Um, a question from Dr. Ayan. What is the next exciting event in gravitational wave detection? We've already seen neutron-neutron star and black hole-black hole collisions. What is next? Uh, very exciting, I think for me would be to see a supernova explosion because we've not yet seen that. So we've seen black hole mergers, neutron star mergers, and recently last year we've detected two black hole neutron star mergers as well. Uh, but it will be absolutely exciting to see supernova explosions and also detecting a black hole neutron star merger with some electromagnetic counterparts. I think that's very exciting. Okay, um, great. Any more questions from the floor? Um, if not, maybe I have one last quick question. So in terms of, you know, you compared fiber laser versus ECDR versus NDEC, and uh, your laser is really impressive in terms of the, the frequency noise and uh, RIN. Um, how low is good enough, actually? Uh, are your specifications are really good enough? Do you foresee trying to improve it? And how much so power do you need? <laughs> So actual gravitational wave detectors in their arm cavities have powers up to like, I think 700 uh, megawatts or uh, sorry, three, three megawatts or something in the arm cavities. So what I built is a very low noise laser, uh, which has an output power of only about 10 milliwatts. But we use that 
simple uh, laser as the seed laser to put in amplifiers that can amplify it to higher powers. But of course, as I said, like the noise is very important for us because the laser is our ruler. So the better is always good. And in terms of frequency noise, we want to see if we can make it much better as well. So in, at low frequencies, we're able to compare it with the standard N pros and the ND yards. But at high frequencies, we do still need that improvement. So there is still work to be done. OK, but very exciting progress. Thank you very much, Disha. And thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much for this opportunity.